1990, a columnist for Parade Magazine upset a bunch of people by simply answering a math uh, riddle. Thousands of people wrote in, angry and self-righteous, and they sent their tweets by writing on paper, folding it up, putting it in an envelope, addressing the envelope, 25 cent postage, send it. Here's some of the things they had to say. You blew it, let me explain. As a professional mathematician, I'm very concerned with the general public's lack of mathematical skills. Since you seem to have difficulty grasping the basic principle at work here, I'll explain. PhDs, both of them, many of them who wrote in. Now you might have guessed that the columnist that these learned gentlemen were replying to was a woman, but not just any woman. Marilyn Voss Savant, uh, at the time, held the Guinness Book of World Records record for having the highest IQ on the planet. The math riddle which she correctly solved is called the Monty Hall problem because it resembles the game uh, Let's Make a Deal hosted by Monty Hall. Now some of you may be familiar with this and I invite you to just sit back and chill. You can leave the mansplaining to me. <laughs> so the basic premise is this. We have three closed doors, behind one of which is a brand new car that you stand to win. Behind the other two are dummy prizes, live goats. Now I recognize that we are in Asheville and many of us might choose the goats over the car. <laughs> However, for argument's sake, let's just say we wanna win the car. So you're faced with three closed doors and you pick whichever one you think maybe has the car behind it. At that point, something interesting happens because Monty Hall, the host, he knows which door hides the car and which two doors hide the goats. So one of the two doors that you didn't open, whether you got it right or got it wrong, one of those two doors is gonna have a goat behind it, at least one. And Monty Hall is gonna reveal that one of those, uh, open one of those doors to reveal a goat every time. So at this point, you're faced with two closed doors and you know that one of them hides a goat and one of them hides a car. The question is, what do you do at this point? Do you stick with your original choice or do you switch to that other closed door? Does it make any difference at all? Yes. It does. It's somewhat counterintuitive, but what Marilyn Voss Savant got correct that so many math experts did not is that by switching from your initial choice to the other closed door, you double your chances of winning the car. You should switch every time. Two out of three times you will win by switching. And again, that's pretty counterintuitive. So I'm gonna to try to convince you in the next few minutes. So when you first make your choice from one of the three doors, no matter which you choose, you have a one in three chance of being correct, of winning, 33%. You have a two thirds chance of getting it wrong, of choosing a door that has a goat behind it. But it's important to remember that this is not a static situation. There's a timeline. You're on a game show, time is passing, and new data is entering uh, the system. So the first piece of data is your selection of door. Now that doesn't increase or decrease the chances that you got it right on your pick, but it does affect what uh, the host does when he chooses which door to open. If you chose a goat with a door that has a goat behind it, which will happen two thirds of the time, then the only door he can open is the other door with the goat, which means that third door would have the car behind it. So again, you start with your one third chance and the other two thirds of a chance are on the other doors and the host is nice enough to open one of those for you so you know exactly which one is most likely to have the car. So I'm curious by, uh, well yeah, so here's another way to think about it is that you're uh, dealing with that timeline and at the point when you first made that decision, you had a one in three chance and that doesn't change because it, you made that choice at that point in time. Only by acting at the point where you see the question mark can you take advantage of the data that was introduced into the system in the meantime? So I'm curious by a show of hands, anybody convinced by this so far? No, not so much convinced, just a handful. All right, that guy doesn't count because he already heard about it. All right, so let's think about this in another way. There's another uh, way to illustrate this that I think is pretty powerful. And that is to imagine that you're now on a game show with 100 doors, all right? But, and the task is the same. So pick a door that you think has the car behind it because 99 of the others have goats behind them. So you pick one, I'm gonna pick the 25th door which is up here in the upper left. And at that point, Monty Hall spends a long time opening 98 other doors to reveal goats. Okay, so at this point, there, the two closed doors are the one that you picked and one that he left open. Again, he knows which door has the car and which doors have the goats. So at this point, would you stick with your original choice or would you switch? Do you think you have a, there's a 50% chance that you picked right the first time? No, you had a one in 100 chance. 
And by switching, 99 times out of 100, you are going to drive into the sunset in your brand new caddy, cream leather interior. It's really only with those small numbers, the smallest possible with three doors, that the, uh, that the probabilities are not seen to us intuitively. By exaggerating the situation, we can see it more clearly. So I'm curious now, anybody else uh, convinced by this latest edition? Only a handful? OK, a few more, a few more. So those of you who are still unconvinced, you've got homework. So that's two apologies from the person who brought you. One, you had to do math tonight. Two, you have homework. Uh, there's plenty of resources online about this. But what about Miss Savant and her, let's say, correspondence? Uh, she went on to publish a follow-up column because she had to address the controversy. And she's basically the boss. She's like, listen, guys, I'm still right, and you're still wrong. Here's why. And she even published a bunch of the letters that she got, which is hilarious, because they all have the professor's names and the schools, because they signed it that way. Uh, so some people were convinced by the follow-up article. This guy, Don, he was not. Uh, he says, maybe women look at math problems differently than men. And you know what? I think his letter proves that. <laughs> so. She went on to publish a third, uh, a second follow-up, a third column, uh, which did actually convince a lot of people because she asked people to uh, take their math classes, whether elementary school or graduate level math, and actually do the exercise, play the game, record the results, and then decide. And of the people that did it, 100% realized that she was right. Don did not. <laughs> he, he, he wrote in a year later to say that he still thinks she's wrong, and you know what? He says there's female logic, and he's right, and it's a good thing there is.